Welcome to part two of the fastest way to your next personal best. What works for you? Training by power, heart rate, or pace? Many runners who take their sports seriously have a heart rate monitor. They know there are heart rate zones and they know where they perform best. This allows them to train and measure their progression in a targeted manner. Why is heart rate monitoring so popular with runners? In 1982, Polar was the first company to come up with a watch for a wide audience that could measure heart rate. With smartphones, Fitbits, heart rate monitors, pedometers, and the Apple Watch, we now have endless brands and devices with which we can measure heart rate, steps, speed, sleep, activity, and stress. But in the early 80s, Polar was actually the first to launch a watch with which you could collect data from your own body. And the data you could collect was heart rate. With a strap around your chest and a watch connected to it, you could see what your heart rate was while you were running. Many researchers and exercise physiologists use these devices to conduct research on topics such as the relationship between heart rate and fuel consumption. We learned that at a low heart rate, you could use your fats relatively more, and that at a higher heart rate, you could use your glycogen stores more. We'll talk more about glycogen later. The relationship between heart rate and lactic acid was extensively explored, and the tipping point became a value that, as an avid runner, you simply had to know. The tipping point, or anaerobic threshold, or AT point, is the heart rate at which you produce more lactic acid than you break down. As a side note, it is worth pointing out that the end product of glycolysis is pyruvate, that if not shuttled to another energy system, the pyruvate becomes lactate. What sometimes gets lost in translation is that lactate, when interacting with hydrogen, turns into lactic acid. Lactic acid is, as mentioned, not negative in its own right, but more to the point is actually the hydrogen ions that cause a lot of problems when lactic acid moves into the blood, separates, and the free hydrogen causes issues that make running more difficult. Lactic acid is sometimes mistakenly seen only as a waste product. What not everyone knows is that you also produce lactic acid with light exertion, and that in low doses, lactic acid is used by the heart as fuel. It's only when you produce more lactic acid than you can use that it starts to become an issue. As lactic acid accumulates, you start to lose performance capability, and you use your glycogen stores to the fullest. You can maintain this intensity for about an hour. What works for you? Training by power, heart rate, or pace? We're going to talk a little bit more about the anaerobic threshold and fuel. Is the anaerobic threshold a new concept for you? We'll briefly explain what it is and why it's so valuable for a runner to know about it. If you exercise more intensively, your muscles need more oxygen because energy must be consumed faster. That's why your heart rate goes up with physical exertion. Your heart pumps more oxygen to your muscles. If you accelerate after a gentle warm-up, your heart rate will increase, as will your breathing frequency and tidal volume. In the beginning, you'll breathe deeper, but not faster. There will automatically become a point, if you keep increasing the intensity, at which you can no longer breathe deeper, yet your whole body will still require more oxygen. That's when you start to breathe faster. This is the moment when a new type of training stimulus starts. At your aerobic threshold, and above this effort, you'll build up fitness. It's called the aerobic threshold because when you're taking in a lot of oxygen, you can mainly use fats as your fuel. You can maintain this intensity for between four to six hours. It varies on the athlete. If you keep increasing intensity beyond the aerobic threshold, you'll reach your anaerobic threshold eventually. You'll breathe less deeply and exponentially faster. Lactic acid accumulates, and you can maintain this effort for about an hour while mainly burning glycogen. You have four fuels to draw from, ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, creatine phosphate, glycogen, and fat. Glycogen and fat are particularly important for endurance athletes. You can run quite a few marathons with your fats as fuel. 
The big advantage of fat is that you can take a lot of energy with you, even if you have a relatively low weight. Even if you have a body fat percentage of, say, 8% and you weigh 70 kilograms or about 154 pounds, you still have 5.6 kilograms or about 12.3 pounds of fat, good for more than six marathons. A disadvantage of fat is that it does provide energy, but the energy is released slowly and a lot of oxygen is needed. So if you run slowly, you can use your fats, but if you increase intensity, you also need another fuel, your glycogen. You have about 500 grams or 1.1 pounds of your glycogen stored in your muscles and in your liver. These 500 grams equal approximately 2,000 kilocalories. Every runner has enough fat to live on for weeks. We sometimes joke that you can easily find out exactly for how long you can persist with fuel stored in your fat stores. Stop eating and then wait until you die. That's how long. You can go with, without food for more than 40 days, which shows that you have fuel you can really use for a long time. A property of fats is that they're energy efficient and last a long time. When you sit in a chair and you're relaxed, you're mainly using your energy efficient fats. When you go for a run, you also use your energy fast sugars. You should not confuse these sugars with the sugars in sweets or sports drinks. It's a general term that includes slower carbohydrates. In exercise physiology, these sugars are called glycogen stores. The glycogen is stored in your liver and around your muscle. A well-trained runner can run on maximum glycogen use for about one and a half to two hours. However, it's not true that the combustion of one fuel stops before the other continues. In other words, you're never running on only fat or only glycogen. And fat always contributes. As you keep adding intensity, more muscle fibers are involved that eat something else. So the idea that one system is switched on, glycogen, and that your other system, fats, no longer participate is not the case. The fact that oxygen uptake increases proportionally with increasing load provides evidence that both systems remain active. If the fat burners in your muscles, which use the most oxygen, stop, the oxygen uptake would no longer increase in a linear fashion. Oxygen uptake does increase linearly, showing that fat burning does indeed continue throughout. Okay, but you might ask yourself, how is this past section useful? How is this knowledge useful? Because you always have more fat than glycogen. As a runner, you want to achieve two things with training. And remember these two things. One, run as fast as possible on your energy efficient fats. And two, store as much glycogen as possible in your liver and muscles. Here's a fun fact before we move on. A kilogram, or about 2.2 pounds of fat, is good for about 9,000 kilocalories. So again, in our example, if you weigh 70 kilograms or 154 pounds, you have a body fat percentage of 20%, you have 14 kilograms of fat times 9,000 kilocalories equals 126,000 kilocalories of fat. You can store about 500 grams of glycogen, which is about 2,000 kilocalories. With this knowledge, you immediately know why many training schedules emphasize that variation is important. You want to train your muscles to run efficiently on fats, and you want to stimulate your muscles to store glycogen. Let's get back to talking about heart rate. Many heart rate monitors, therefore, work with zones based on this tipping point that we addressed. There are three general zones that we're just going to address here. We'll call zone one very easy. It has little training effect. It's about recovery. For your body, fuel consumption is comparable to sitting on the couch. Not much happens. In terms of training, however, it's part of your schedule that should not be underestimated. In this very easy, or we'll call it zone one, you run, but you don't build up excessive fatigue, damage your muscles to an extensive amount, tendons, ligaments, and joints don't get as much stress as the other zones. Zone 2 
if you exercise more intensively, you'll reach your aerobic threshold. And this is where a different type of training effect begins. And in zone three, if you keep increasing training intensity, you'll arrive at your lactate acid turning point, and you'll no longer be able to maintain your power. This is the anaerobic threshold. If you're already familiar with the concept of critical power, which we'll touch more on later, this concept should sound familiar. Though we describe three zones here, you'll often see five zones in heart rate training because three zones are distinguished between the aerobic and the anaerobic threshold. And there's also a separate zone above your turning point. The three stages we mentioned earlier can be registered faster and more clearly by looking at your breathing. When you get up from the couch and you go outside to run, you start to breathe deeper. So the first zone is that you take deeper breaths without breathing faster. At the aerobic threshold, your body asks for more oxygen and you breathe faster, as we described in the box about aerobic threshold in this section we covered earlier. You'll keep increasing intensity, so you'll breathe faster and faster with the same tidal volume until you reach your tipping point, the anaerobic threshold. At this point, you can no longer deepen your breathing because you still need more oxygen. You'll breathe faster, but more shallowly. Physiologically, your breathing responds faster than your heart rate, which makes it ideal for targeted training. It's just that back in 1982, it was easier for the company Polar to measure heart rate via belt than to measure respiratory frequency and tidal volume, so they decided to go with a heart rate monitor. Now, when you get a new heart rate monitor, you take it out of the box and you turn it on, you might be prompted with some questions that you have to answer, like, what language do you speak? What time is it? Do you want a 12-hour or 24-hour time format? Do you wear your watch on the left or right side? How much do you weigh? What's your year of birth? And that's where it goes wrong. Your watch determines your maximum heart rate based on your age. There's a standard formula that determines your maximum heart rate that you might have heard before, 220 minus your age. Based on this invented maximum heart rate, the monitor will determine your zones. This is a shame because for many runners, the standard formula does not apply at all. Suppose you're 45 years old and you have an actual maximum heart rate of 195. Your watch says 220 minus your age, again, 45. That gives you a maximum heart rate of 175 beats per minute. If you then train in these zones in a targeted manner, you'll become quite annoyed because every time you run smoothly, your heart rate monitor starts to beep that you should slow down. In this way, you'll structure training too carefully and at a certain point, you'll no longer make progress. That is a shame and you can do better. Heart rate measurement has taught us a lot in the last 40 years. And with the reliable heart rate monitor and sufficient knowledge, you can train on flat terrain as long as you don't do super short intervals. In some cases, however, a heart rate monitor is not suitable. For example, with your interval training of 200 or 400 meter repeats, by the time your heart rate starts to get high, you're already at the end. Running uphill is another issue when training by heart rate. Your pace drops and your heart rate shoots up and your results are hard to compare to your flat training laps. But the biggest danger of heart rate training is an inaccurately measured heart rate. Many major brands have switched from measurements via a strap around the chest to a wrist monitor, and those are still far from accurate for everyone. Runners who often suffer from cold hands generally get inaccurately low heart rate values from a wrist monitor. Author Ron himself has had a different experience. His wrist monitor indicates that values are too high. If you look at the physiology of a person, it actually makes more sense to measure breaths instead of heart rate. The three stages and zones we mentioned earlier, again, can be registered faster and more clearly by looking at your breathing. When you get up from the couch, again, and you go outside to run, you start to breathe deeper. So that verse zone, again, is when you start to take deeper breaths without breathing faster. At this aerobic threshold we talked about, you start to breathe faster, and we get to that aerobic and then anaerobic. And again, we talked about increasing intensity. You'll start to breathe faster and faster. And this is a thing that you can look at instead of just looking at the heart rate and the beats per minute. Before heart rate monitors even emerged, enthusiastic runners trained by pace. 
Funnily enough, training by pace in the 1970s and 1980s was very reliable, but nowadays that's no longer the case. How is that possible? 50 years ago, there were no watches that determined your speed via GPS. So if you started training focused on pace, you were forced to train with a stopwatch and to know your distance very precisely. On a running track, you could calculate exactly how fast you had to run your 200, 400, or 1,000 meter repeats to train at a certain pace. That way of tempo training is, of course, still reliable and still very popular with track training. With your fastest time at a certain distance, like 3 kilometers, 5 kilometers, 10 kilometers, you can calculate what your possible times are at other distances. You can also determine what your intensive interval pace is or your leisurely endurance runs are. So what's the problem? Many runners have a Garmin, Polar, Koros, and train by pace using their watch as a compass. Unfortunately, this way of measuring is not always reliable because the watch bases your speed on GPS data. Your watch is connected to satellites and uses the distance between the different position measuring points to know how fast you took to get from point A to point B. Tall buildings, trees with wet leaves, winding roads, or not enough connected satellites can all contribute to GPS measurement errors. Pace-based GPS varies from moment to moment and is not very useful. Of course, the measurements are stable over a long distance because the deviations average out. Therefore, if you run a marathon, typically, your distance will always be around 42.195 kilometers or 26.2 miles, although you're not always running the ideal line and your watch is always slightly off. We all know that when training on a track and using Strava, it sometimes seems as if you've cut straight across the middle area. That's simply because your watch combined two satellite points and missed the curve in between. Another disadvantage of running with a heart rate monitor is that your heart rate responds slowly. When you run up a hill, your muscles immediately use more energy, but your heart rate takes time to notice that your muscles need more oxygen and it needs to pump faster. So if you walk up a hill with a constant heart rate, you have to work hard for the first part and you have to walk very slowly for the second part. This is just one of the great advantages of using stride for training. You train by power, and stride does not depend on GPS or heart rate, but it measures the power with the accelerometers on your foot. And it turns out to be extremely reliable. The breakthrough in power running came with the use of inertial measurement units, or IMUs. We typically call them accelerometers. These are small instruments in a chip that can be used to measure accelerations. The measuring principle is based on the fact that the crystals in the chip produce a piezoelectric effect under the influence of an acceleration. This effect results in a voltage that can be measured. The stride chip accurately measures this voltage more than 100 times per second, which makes the device ingenious and reliable. Eh, Ron and Hans, I don't really know what you're saying. Plain human language, please. Okay. We have a great everyday example. Thanks to an accelerometer, your mobile phone knows whether you're holding it horizontally or vertically. If you watch a video on YouTube and you tilt your phone, the image on your screen tilts. With this exact same type of technology, your running watch knows your cadence and number of steps. Accelerometers today are very cheap, very accurate, and they're found in all kinds of devices such as smartphones, cars, tablets, pedometers, and running watches. A smart power meter uses this technology to determine your speed and stride cadence, and that turns out to be much more reliable than GPS. The stride power meter is currently leading the way in converting this technology into reliable speed and power measurements for runners. The sensor includes six accelerometers. These measure the acceleration of your body while running in three directions horizontal, vertical, and lateral or sideways. Obviously, in running, it's important to limit vertical and lateral movements as this consumes energy that doesn't contribute to forward displacement. Everyone has a certain optimal economic step frequency and technique. With stride, you can determine which running technique suits you best. As mentioned, 
Stride takes measurements many times per second, which makes the accuracy of the device very precise. And Stride doesn't just measure your movement from side to side, top to bottom, and your speed forward, but also air pressure, temperature, humidity. These measurements combined with your weight and height, together with Stride's well thought out algorithms, accurately reflect your power. When you run, you can see your power in watts via your smartphone, Apple Watch, running watch. Your power is calculated from your weight, then measured with acceleration in those three directions, the speed and the air resistance with some basic formulas. Like if you think back to high school physics, you might remember force equals mass times acceleration. Stride's breakthrough is the software it's developed to calculate the power by using all the data from the accelerometers continuously and in real time. As we know, the basic formulas are simple, but a complicated algorithm is needed to accurately calculate the power based on the accelerations in all directions. The advantage of the Stride foot pod is that it gives you a pure and exact measurement of power in real time. This gives you a much better and objective picture of your effort than your feeling, your speed, or your heart rate alone. And the biggest advantage for runners who prefer simplicity rather than to read complicated books about training or listen to a droning on and on audiobook recitation of that same book, you only need to train with one number in mind. As long as you know which level of power you need for which training, that's enough. Let's talk a little bit about why wattages from other companies might be a little different, might be wrong. One of Cohn's running friends wanted to know what his expected time was on a half marathon. To calculate, he used the power of a fast 10k he ran. I may not have gone all the way because I was running on my own, but I did my best anyway, said Joost. His time on the 10k was 44 minutes and 15 seconds, and his power was 357 watts. So, they used 357 watts as his critical power and started calculating. According to formulas, after some calculations, he'd end up running a half marathon of 1 hour, 16 minutes, and 34 seconds. That can't be true. Did you enter your correct weight and stride? I don't have a stride, said Joost. I measured it with my polar. What did we find out after we took a look into the numbers? The power measured by Polar and Garmin is far too high. Hans and Ron have done several studies that showed that the wattages of Polar and Garmin were 25 to 35% higher than those of Stride. The differences can be explained by the fact that Polar and Garmin derive their power readings from measurements with force plates in the lab. However, this doesn't take into account the energy recovery in muscles during the landing phase. Stride bases calculations on the actual power required to move around while running, resulting in this difference of 25-35%. to 35%. In addition, Polar and Garmin use GPS, which is much less accurate. Incidentally, the relatively new brand Koros does make use of the necessary power to move around while running. Koros has fully integrated this information from the Stride foot pod. This makes the Koros watch actually a strong duo with Stride. Koros can also measure the power based on GPS, but this is still, again, as we covered, less accurate, especially with changes in speed and course. Koros also doesn't take into account the resistance from the wind, so for now, Stride works best. That wraps it up for this part. Stay tuned for our next episode. What is critical power and what can you do with it? Thanks so much for listening, and we'll be back with another episode very shortly.